press the bell icon on the YouTube app to never miss a video from News Laundry. Hello, hello, hello. Mic check. Stand by. Just a wonderful old fashioned thing. <laughs> it's like a sort of human clapperboard. Welcome, Karan, to News Laundry, although this is your studio. Um, wonderful studio, I must say. Thank you. You had an extremely successful launch yesterday, created a buzz, and uh, I think it attracted the attention you planned. The, you're saying that uh, you go to a civilized country for Christmas and New Year, has set up a Twitter storm, as you wanted, and has given you the attention that you're looking for for your book. So I must congratulate you on your marketing techniques. <laughs> you are superb in getting the attention, even if it's for a bad reason. Anyway, um, first I should introduce you a little bit. Uh, Karan uh, worked for 10 years in the United Kingdom in television and some in print also, and then returned in 1991 to television in India, where you did Eyewitness, uh, Home TV, which I think flopped, which you don't mention in your book, you only mention successes, and, <laughs> and uh, Hard Talk, which is uh, not uh, uh, to the point with India Today, and Devil's Advocate, which was a huge success with CNN, IBN. And uh, now the book. And you wrote in your book that you think journalists who write about themselves are crashing bores. So why did you write the book? I suppose there's an obvious contradiction and you very correctly pointed it out, but I wrote the book because I had time on my hands. Um, my secretary said to me that instead of spending your time writing articles, and I've been doing three or four a month for newspapers in addition to my two regular columns, he said, why don't you put yourself and make the effort and do something substantial? And I said, if I'm going to do that, the only thing I can really do without getting involved in lengthy and debilitating research is write about the interesting things that have happened in my life. And there are a fair number of them. So I started dictating the book to Santosh, and over the next four and a half months, this book was dictated, sometimes half a chapter, sometimes just a couple of thousand words. But uh, every second, third day, we'd do a little dictation, he'd type it up, I'd correct it, and the book happened. Uh, now you stand out as one of the few left on Indian television with that clipped British accent, almost British accent. Um, you are an avowed and proud Anglophile. And doesn't that, I mean, doesn't your accent and that attitude sort of date you? Isn't it out of touch with where India is today? I don't know if it dates me, but that is me. Um, I speak English the way I've always spoken it, partly because of the upbringing I had with my parents in India, who were also Anglophiles and who spoke English, perhaps uh, possibly in the same way. Um, I've then been in England for about 20 odd years, studying as well as working. And I suppose the accent is a result of all of that. It, to my ears, it doesn't sound very British at all. I have no, to be you don't have an you. accent. I'm talking about your approach to things, uh, the way you uh, interview, the way you function as a talk show host. It's been a, it sort of falls into the Latians category, which is now, of course, BJP Latians. But it does fall into the accusation that many people make that this is a small elite group of people who interview people who they know and then go back to the cocktail parties and it's not real journalism. Well, there are many things you said there in that one answer question. Um, first of all, falling into the Latchens category is a description. It's a description that is used pejoratively these days. But I would say that falling into the Latchens category means that you're not Desi and Gamar. And I don't wish to be Gamar in any sense of the term. I am what I am. If you don't like it, don't, accept, don't have me. You don't have to watch. It's not compulsory. If you're happy, you understand what I'm saying. If it makes sense for you, if you like my manner, if you think I'm professional, please watch. As for the question that I interview just a close circle of people and therefore this is not journalism, I don't think that's true. Um, the interviews that I've had range from the BJP in the days when they were willing to give me one all the way to the communists at the other end of the political spectrum. A lot of people in between such as the Samajwadi Party or the Congress Party, um, the Trinamool Congress as well as a whole lot of people from different walks of life. Cricketers, I've done a several series with cricketers, artists, actors, directors, authors. Um, the only commonality that distinguishes them from others is that they have to be fluent in English because that is the language I'm most comfortable in. Now, if you say that people who are fluent in English are not really 
um, Indian in that sense because they don't consider an uh, Indian language their first language, then yes, I'm guilty of interviewing a small circle. But I would say to you that the whole of South India would be happy to be interviewed in English and not in Hindi. And so the, the definition that you have to interview in Hindi or do your journalism in Hindi would cut out half our country. Well, just as a conversation, when I first started News Track, I used to get calls from our Bombay marketing team saying that, uh, why don't you get professional voiceover people to do the, the voiceovers? Because I wanted my regionally accented correspondents to do it in their accent. And I felt that this was breaking away from a sound that people were used to, such as Sudhir Dhar, Dhar Melville, the Mellow, which re who, who really had British accents. I had to fight for it. And I think that there's a certain uh, connotation and respect that comes when you listen to an, uh, to an regional accent in English and you treat it with as much respect as, say, a French accent or whatever. But you seem to think that that accent makes you a Dehati or Gewar. No. Not necessarily. It's not the accent I was talking about, nor were you. You began by talking about my manner. And it was the manner that I commented on and said that if this manner, my clipped way of speaking as you described it, or my way of conducting myself, which includes my appearance, my dress, uh, my general demeanor. But if talking that's about your dress. Luxions, then I said the opposite of that is to be Gawar and Desi, and I'm happy I'm not. But I wasn't talking about accent at all. I am totally with you when I think you need to have a variety of English accents. You're as not well happy as a being variety Desi. If you use the word Desi in the pejorative sense in which it often no, was used, then no. I'm not happy being Desi. But if Desi no, today Desi being, is said with pride. Well, if it means being Indian, I'm very happy to be Indian. I am Indian, in fact. There's no you can't help it. No, no talk, I can't help it. I embrace it with pride. You've written in your book about uh, when you were in, in college in England and you, um, about your sartorial appearance and people thought you were fey, even gay. So now you've you're probably the only person I've seen on television who wears that bow tie. <laughs> Why? Oh. Why? Uh, Why do you love this bow tie so much? I'll tell you, it's a... It's an anachronism in India. It represents another era. It may be an anachronism in India. It's not an anachronism in countries like America, but I wear a bow tie to attract attention. I thought that was pretty obvious to anyone. It becomes a talking point. It makes people watch. It makes people remember. It creates an image that is distinct and different to that of others. It's a wonderful way of projecting yourself. And I thought everyone understood that he wears a bow tie. To attract, attract attention. Of course. There are lots of things we all do to attract attention, let's be honest. Well, we usually speak, journalists instance, speak, let their attention. work speak for themselves rather than their outfits. Oh, journalists find many ways of making things speak so for you, themselves, uh, not we just saw their from outfit. La last night's language uh, you book launch, you are ma as I said before, you are a master at marketing yourself. Now, I take that as a compliment. Thank you very much. I don't give it as a compliment. No, but I take it as one. <laughs> I know you don't because you use the word marketing in a pejorative sense, but I take it as a compliment. I think the object of a book launch is to attract attention to the author and the book. And if one way of doing so is the sort of answers I gave, if another is the way I dress, if a third is the way I talk and conduct myself, well, to me, those are all plus points. You wrote in your book, and I do remember this also, that you would ask one of your reporters to ask the then Prime Minister Chandrasekhar about why he didn't comb his hair, why he wore this disheveled look with the crumpled dhoti. But when it happened, you attracted attention, but more of the negative kind. And in fact, I reacted like, this guy seems to be out of touch with India. No politician who understands India will ever look uh, groomed because it makes you accuses you of being oh, suited a, and booted. There's a difference so, between looking groomed and suited and booted and wearing disheveled dhotis that are crushed and probably in need of a good thorough wash and your hair unkept and windswept. Uh, it's very Indian to actually put your best foot forward. Mums send out their kids in public with surma in their eyes, with their hair oil, that, with their face nicely scrubbed. So I was actually comparing him to a very un-Indian way of con behaving and suggested that he was being hippie. That was what we were putting across. <laughs> yeah. Hippie, Poor disheveled, Chandra. windswept, you're unconcerned about your appearance and your clothes. That's not Indian at all. We may not be groomed in the Western sense. But, but the standards are not the same. Presented. People who know that they're politicians who are campaigning, for example, are out in the grime, in the dust. But we weren't talking about people campaigning. We were talking about a prime minister sitting in his office. Yeah, but if his ethos is that he's, 
used to a kind of style which is comfortable and is not uh, groomed the way your standards are? I think it's an obnoxious question, don't, I don't you? I don't think it's an obnoxious question. I think it's a perfectly acceptable question. Certainly, it's one that India wasn't used to at that time. And you suggest to me, even 20 odd years later, India isn't used to it today. Uh, however, I think asking people who are elected to govern you about the manner in which they present themselves and deliberately choose to do so, particularly when it defies conventional wisdom, as it did in this instance, is a perfectly acceptable thing to do. Now, Those are personal questions, but there's nothing wrong with personal questions. Another uh, point that has come to everyone's attention, I wouldn't say everyone, but people's attention, is Pavan Verma's uh, inclusion in the book, mm -hmm. and he has denied it. Did you, before putting it in, call him and tell him that you were going to put it in, the comment? No, I didn't. And in fact, I explained to Pavan why I didn't. First of all, this was admittedly a private conversation in the sense that there were only two people in the room present, him and me. Therefore, it was private by definition. But it was not a confidential conf conversation. I have had, at that particular point of time, many other conversations with Pavan that were confidential. He repeatedly said to me, please don't make this public. And I never have and never will. But this was a conversation that, A, wasn't barred by being made confidential. And secondly, it was a conversation about an issue that was of great importance to me personally. He was intending for me not just to know it, but clearly he was intending for me to use this in some sense and form. And secondly, that's your interpretation. Of course, it's my interpretation. It has because to be. Because he. And secondly, remember, his denial is a very artfully crafted denial. He says, the conversation, as recalled by Karan, hasn't happened, which clearly suggests that some other sort of conversation may well have happened. And thirdly, when I spoke to him, he said that I was probably quoting him out of context. And I said, I can't see how any context would change the meaning of what you told me. But the most important thing is this. I'm aware that Pavan has issued, as I call it, a carefully crafted denial, which is not an upfront and total denial, but it looks and appears like one. I would say that he's possibly somewhat embarrassed by the fact that something that was an indiscretion on his part, and undoubtedly it was an indiscretion and a deliberate indiscretion on his part to tell me this, was then made public. And one of the reasons why I didn't go back and say, I'm writing a book and I intend to make this part of the book, is because that would have been inviting, in fact, asking him to confirm an indiscretion. And that's putting him, a friend, in an embarrassing position. But if he's your friend, you exposed him in the worst way. I didn't expose him at all. I don't see how Pavan has exposed. Pavan has simply reported something that was told to him by Prashant Kumar to the person it was about. But how does it told you him? alone. And if every time somebody, a politician, speaks to someone and has to has to constantly say, this is confidential, this is off the record, nobody would speak to you. Well, hang on a moment. There are loads of conversations that I had privately because there are just two people in the room or you're just talking to that one person. It doesn't mean to say that everything that's said privately is confidential. It doesn't mean to say that everything that's privately can't be repeated. And in this instance, I'm not repeating it in any way that would harm Pavan whatsoever. Well, he seems to think so. Well, he may think so, but it's quite obvious it doesn't. It's quite obvious that having been indiscreet in telling me something, and I appreciate and admire him for his indiscretion. And then you trash, you I expose haven't him. It. I haven't no, trashed it. I haven't trashed it at all. No, you expose him after he does you a favor. No, it's not an expose. Is that friendship? Well, it's not expose. This is the funny thing. You're using a word completely out of place. It's a bit of a malapropism. I have not exposed him. I have not revealed him in a bad light. I have not in any way said something that he should be embarrassed by having said. I've simply reported a conversation he had, which is about me. And in fact, in repeating that conversation about me, I am confirming through that conversation an entire line of argument that runs through that chapter. So it's not embarrassing Karen, for your, Pavan at all. Your uh, lines of friendship seem to be extremely grey. The guy speaks to you in private between you and him. A conversation takes place and you think that you believe that every conversation that takes place with a politician or anyone else is fair game to be published. Let me point out to you what you probably didn't hear, but I mentioned in my very first answer on this subject that there were at that point of time, and that's critical, at that point of time, many other issues that Pavan and I were discussing, which he had brought up, which he revealed to me, and which he explicitly and repeatedly and very insistently said, I must keep confidential. This was not said at all about this. And that so he can't says, say it after every sentence? Oh, hang on a second. It was on the same day, it, right? It, in the same place you're saying. Same time. And you said it was the same time. And then you expect him to say confidential after every sentence? No, I don't expect if him to say... If he said it to you once in the room, no, that should be enough. I don't expect him to say confidential that after every sentence. That should be enough. It wasn't on the same day. I said it was at the same time, meaning in the same time span. Exactly. It wasn't in the same day. So in the same time, fra time frame, somebody has told in you this is confidential. In the same period of a week. He, you expect Madhu, him to keep Madhu, repeating it over the, and over again. That's extreme. Madhu, 
in the same time period, meaning in the same week, there were many conversations with Baba, not on the same day, in the same time period. That's why I said at that time, meaning at that time of week or at that time of month, there were several conversations with him, which he clearly asked me to keep private. And if he wanted to, he would have said it about this. He didn't. He's simply embarrassed. And I can understand because his indiscretion has been made public and it will have obviously an impact on people like Prashant Kishore. And more importantly, it's not Prashant Kishore that I guess he's worried about, but the impact it will have on Mr. Modi, because the relationship that Pavan and his party have with Mr. Modi today is significantly different to the relationship that the party had with Mr. Modi when this conversation happened. But and you it's have significantly no forms of no, you're calling it an indiscretion, yeah. which was done as a favor to you, yeah. and you have no qualms. No, none. On, on no, none. I'm that asking kind you now. I have no qualms at all. None, it's, none whatsoever. It's, a, it's I not an expose. Feel sorry anyway. for your friends. It's not an because, expose. Because it's not you an ex can, you knew that it would embarrass him, and you still did it. And you call, it, call yourself a friend. I knew that it would That's embarrass him, but I don't think it friends. was a sort of embarrassment that would be crippling, and I don't think it is. Pavan remains a good friend. And we've well, spoken yesterday you dismissed it as a senior moment, I do, which I was still kind do. of cruel. It's not. Pavan and I are the same age. So maybe you were having the senior moment. But I can't have a senior moment. I could have an hallucination, possibly. In other words, I could have made up a conversation. But I can't have a senior moment. I mean, you can so that was me. your senior you moment that you me. made it up? You can accuse me of manufacturing an entire conversation. right? But I reported it because I said to myself that Pavan has no... Um, agenda in repeating this to me. He wouldn't embellish it. He wouldn't manufacture a story. He happened to be sitting in my office and looked upon the photograph of Mr. Modi when Mr. Modi was walking out of a particular interview and asked if that was the particular time when the interview happened and when Modi walked out. And I said, yes. And then he told me the story. And at that time, by the way, when he told me the story, I think the date was the 17th of October, 2017. I actually dictated, as soon as Pavan left, a note to my secretary as an aid memoir to myself so that what Pavan had said would always be fresh in my memory because it was clearly such an important thing to hear. You're a very hurtful friend. Now, let's... Well, that's your comment and conclusion, but I no, don't it's think... it's in public. Well, We're doing, doing this in public I don't to think a Pavan, friend. I don't it's think not my comment. I don't, think, doing this in I don't public. think Pavan has been hurt. How does it feel to not be given credit for what you have been a pioneer in? Which is? And what are we talking about? We're talking about being rude, obnoxious, um, interrupting people, Arnab has overtaken the le what you started in India. You were known for that. And now he's f the but Chela sure has surpassed you. But I'm not sure. First of all, he's never been a Chela of mine. He's never worked with me. We've never been in the same company together. But your influence together. is clearly there. But that's your pr assumption. But I don't see how this question follows. What does it feel like to be denied credit? Who's denying me credit? And People what credit am I claiming? People have forgotten that you were the one who started the shouting and the yelling and the interrupting and being but rude Madhu, to people. I'm not, I've never claimed credit. He's gone far, he even Nova throws off denied, people off I've, his show. You, I've never claimed. You've just had people walking off your show in disgust. But he throws people out. So he surpassed you and, and I think that you've been cheated. Wonderful. I applaud him for surpassing me. All credit to him. You were also a pioneer in not according dignity to the person you interview, such as your interview with Ramjit Milani, where you said to him that you're uh, taking up Manu Sharma's case to resurrect a flagging career. Now, isn't that unkind? I mean, what if I said to you, Karan, you're writing a book because you have no platform, you have no, your career is over. And that's why you're writing this book, because you have nothing left. Isn't that unkind? No, because if you believe it to be the truth, why is it unkind? But don't I mean, you have are you, are you in the business? Are you in the business of putting on a facade, probably hypocritical and probably wanting to appear to be nicer than you are? If you have a question in your mind and you think it's a legitimate question to ask, go ahead and ask it. It's kind or unkind is an irrelevance. No, it's a question of there are certain human values that a journalist usually maintains that you can't Human values are usually brought up as a moral bludgeon to try and tackle someone when you have no other better way of doing so. You're bringing up morality simply as a way of trying to score a point. You know full well there is no morality involved here whatsoever. 
if your morality is so elastic, no, it's, Karan, elastic. it's totally so why elastic. Why are we quarreling like little you children? Can, we're behaving, can, we're behaving like in an this. earlier interview with me. We're both behaving like little this children is, trying to score no, points with each other. That's your defense. I mean, you're, defense. you're distracted. It's you're going comment. off the point. I'm simply saying we're behaving like You're going like off the point by attacking me and saying that. I'm not attacking you. I'm simply saying we're behaving like little children trying to score points against each other. It, the belief that somehow this is of interest to the audience. No, I'm asking you a question that when you say that, to someone that you're interviewing, you have not accorded him a certain amount of decency or, or dignity. You rob him of that. I hear what you say. I accept that that's your opinion. It's different to mine. And you, sh you show yourself to be totally cruel and unkind and you don't care how it affects people on a human level as long as you get your story and as long as you get the attention. This is also your opinion and I have to point out that I don't agree well, with it. All but my you have questions every will be right based on my it. opinion, obviously, not on yours, Karan. Obviously, and you have every right to it. But I have to bring up the issue that when you have done interviews which are really nasty and, and I would think that you would have some sense of your conscience should be tickled a little bit, but, but I'm being mean. You, it's interesting that you should bring up as an interview one that is you consider particularly nasty, immoral, unethical, unkind. Those are all words that you use. An interview that actually not only cemented... You got awards a, for it, right? Not, not only cemented a relationship with Ram Jaitmalani, right? But ended with Ram Jaitmalani that evening itself saying to me, Are yaar, come, let's have a nice whiskey together. You so wrote that in the book, but you're very naive. It's people just true. say that at the end of every interview after you've trashed so them. They people do. don't say Even that at the end Narendra of every Modi interview. Even Narendra Modi also said to you, Dosti bane re. But you Doesn't know mean from anything. Dosti bane? You know what you know Dosti from Pabal Varma. But you know from Pabal Varma why he said it, didn't you? He said it deliberately because he wanted to leave Karan with the belief, the false belief, that there was no ill will and hurt on his side. And the while same with Ram Jaitmalani. There's a false belief also, on your part. No, there's not because there were several interviews and several relationships and several dinners with Ram Jaitmalani after that, which are not in the book. Because there was no need for them to be in the book. And the belief, therefore, that this was unkind, immoral, unethical, somehow trespassing the bounds of good journalism, is certainly not a belief that he shared. You can believe what you want to believe. Well, obviously, I want to believe he what I flipped, want to believe. He flipped on your camera. Uh, he was obviously upset. And you got him upset because you wanted him upset because your journalism is basically just to attract attention. OK. If that's it's your not opinion. really asking a question. If that's your opinion, you're absolutely But you say that about everything. Right that's my opinion. Of course. course, my questions are based on my opinion. It's a very simple question. But the answer is no, I don't think it was unkind. Now, you also were a pioneer of moving away from doing actual stories to just interview-based programs not issue based and in that sense television has now followed through on that that most of the programs are not issue based they're always personality based so there's a second sense in which i could claim credit for something no one's given me credit for yeah, really? ordnos behavior is one where yes. i could claim credit Absolutely. this is another yes interesting see you should be thankful i am deeply praising you thankful. for these things now your style of interviewing you've been working in india for now 30 years since 1991 yeah so approximately, it hasn't changed. Have you adjusted at all to the digital age? What would that adjustment mean in your eyes? It means that changing your form of journalism. Such as? Give me an example and I can then answer your question. Which means you combine text with interviews. You do different things on the net, which connects with your interview. You don't have to combine text simply by going to the net. You can combine text by quoting from it. You can combine text by putting up a graphic on the screen which has the text that you want to involve. There are many ways of involving text in an interview. You don't have to do it necessarily digitally. But your style has digitally. been basically stuck. No. no. It's I'd, the same. If you think so, you have every right to. That's my opinion. Of course. Every answer is that's your opinion. No, but you have every right to that. OK, now when you and I were doing, covering the election live for India Today, for Doordarshan actually, and India Today was doing it, and you were on there also, one of the co-anchors. Do you remember? I do indeed. It okay. was 1998 and 1999. Yeah. So you did not, you came on board only with the condition that Uday Shankar would be speaking to you in an earpiece. Now, were you not confident of knowing the subject of Indian politics and interviewing without his questions Actually, in you've helping got, you? you've got it completely wrong. Hmm. I came on air with the condition that only Uday Shankar would be speaking to me, not that Uday Shankar had oh, to. Oh, so now I we make it want... only, but, he, but you had to bring him with you. 
to give you the questions. Uh, no, I didn't bring him to give me the questions. I brought him simply so that if the other commands that had to be given would be given by him. I didn't want a plethora of different voices that I was unfamiliar with speaking in my ear. That's all. That's a nice way to get out of it. Well, it's not a nice way to get out of it. You only hear the truth, Madhu. What other, You're what getting other the truth. instructions could he be giving other than feeding you the questions? No, he wasn't feeding the questions, not even one. And if you wish, you can check with him. I would suspect that you're probably having what I described of someone else, a very senior moment. <laughs> so anything you don't like puts people in a senior moment. No. Have you ever been to any village yes. in India? Yes, Which several one? in the Punjab. Doing what? Reporting? No. Hmm. Visiting. And any small Meeting towns? Meeting farmers. Small towns. Several. I don't see the point of these silly questions. Karan, for you they're silly. The point is... For me they're more than journalist. silly, forgive me. They are again a reflection of your desperate attempt calling to try me and... Names. No, I'm not calling, calling you names. It's a desperate attempt on your part to try and to reveal an Karan in an uncomplimentary light by throwing either things that will provoke him or by questioning his credentials as a journalist or by suggesting that he's never visited a farm or a village or a small town by mocking and if that's your attitude to the person I sometimes wonder why you wanted to interview him to begin with Karan and what has that got to do with the book I haven't the Karan, faintest idea listen you have put all kinds of things in the book all right Whenever you get an uncomfortable question, you say that I'm here to make you uncomfortable. You say that I don't know why you're doing this That's interview. That's not in the book. Where do you the read that? The point is that Where do you read all of that? As a journalist. That's not in the book. No. Where have you picked it up from? Picked what up from? That I say to people, I'm here to make you uncomfortable. No, I just said to you that you're telling me that I'm doing this interview to make you uncomfortable. Not to make me uncomfortable, to try and expose or reveal in an uncomplimentary light. None. You're not making me uncomfortable because you have every right to do it. I just wonder what purpose it serves. I'm not denying you the Listen, your prerogative to do it. That's the last thing you should say. That's the last thing you should say, Karan. Because none of your La interviews... Which is the last thing I should say? That, that an interview is being done to expose you in a bad light. I'm not because an interview is done not to expose somebody in the bad light, but just simply done to get quest answers to questions. So I think you're unnecessarily pushing it into an area because you, you are being made uncomfortable. I don't intend to make you I'm uncomfortable. I'm not being made uncomfortable But these are questions which I'm just I think are easy I, I just, to answer. I'm just, no, I'm very happy to answer whatever question you ask and you can keep asking them. I just wonder whether this serves any in entertaining purpose for the audience because I think the audience will by now have said to themselves, these are two crashing balls who yeah. take themselves a little yeah, bit just, too seriously. Just, just because more you're importantly, squirming I'm over the questions and then you're making it into an right. unpleasant interview. I'm not making You it. don't have to make it into an unpleasant interview. Just answer the questions, I Karan. I have tried. I've tried very hard, but every You're time I do... You're getting just totally into a negative space when, obviously, I'm asking you ahead, questions based on things. Ask whatever you want, Madhu. You're the interviewer. Ask whatever you want. Now, <laughs> again, you asked... You wrote about Sambit Patra, and you asked him, like, why is the BJP boycotting me? And he asked you, can you keep a secret? Absolutely, and I wrote it. And you assured him. And I wrote it. And you assured but him I that, yes, I revealed that can. fact. I'm the one who revealed the fact and therefore I'm the one who was making clear that I was in this instance breaching a confidence. It's in the book. I it's know, not that's what that I'm somebody saying. could have told you. I have told the world that. Yeah, but is that, is that, you seem to think that it's alright to breach anybody's confidence. No, not anybody's, his. And the reason I breached his confidence is because what he had told me in confidence was then confirmed shortly thereafter by three others considerably senior to him, starting with Prakash Javdekar, but including Ram you, Madhav, and at one level, Arun Jaitley. And he, no, in and, that instance, that I didn't. I didn't. You, I didn't. So you have basically amoral, that you don't need to keep secrets, you don't need to keep your word? I wouldn't jump to How that conclusion. How un-British can you be? I wouldn't jump to that conclusion. Then how do you describe a person who's somebody who's trying to help you, tells you something in confidence, tells you clearly that it's a secret, and then you write about it? Yes, that's what I did. I did that. It's in the book. It's not something you've dug up. I've revealed it to the world myself. No, I'm not claiming I've dug it up. I'm asking you that isn't this something that you seem to have no qualms over? No, clearly I don't have any because I wouldn't have put it in the book. Now, you spent numerous pages in your book enumerating BJP's boycott of you. Mm -hmm. Why do you have to go knocking on their doors? The pages and pages you spoke to so-and-so, you spoke to so-and-so. Why can't you do journalism without them? Because I 
felt as a journalist that I had a certain moral duty to myself to make sure that boycotts don't happen, particularly boycotts for which I see no valid justification whatsoever. And therefore, if I can take some steps to try and remedy the situation and end the boycott, it was incumbent on me to do so. That so was basically your journalism is based on access journalism? No, I'm not sure if you want to come to that conclusion, but if you feel it's a valid conclusion, as I said, you have every right to it. I wouldn't describe my journalism as access journalism, but go ahead. Well, what other stories have you done besides accessing politicians? Madhu, let's leave that aside. This is a question that is designed once again to suggest that Karan's limitations are the more important concern. There are loads of people who are current affairs. Karan, can I finish? You're taking things can very badly. Can I finish? They're not meant badly. You're, I know. They're legitimate I know questions. imitation is the highest form of flattery, but don't <laughs> imitate me by interrupting everything I say <laughs> because we end up no, quarreling with each that other. That is a given. Right? That I'm I know, to. I know that, but absolutely. But it's a strange form of flattery to imitate me by interrupting me. All I was saying to you is that there are two clearly different streams of journalism. There's news reportage and there's current affairs discussions. And I have so you're in access journalism, there's nothing wrong in that. The access journalism is a pejorative way of describing something which you want to color. I wouldn't call it access journalism, I would call it current affairs journalism. But there's no issues discussed, there's of no course current there are affairs. Issues discussed. I'm, I'm terribly you're, sorry. You're focused on a personality. No, it's not focused on the personality. None of my interviews are personality interviews except for those done for the BBC program Face to Face which were designed to be personality interviews. All the others are actually entirely issue based. Now, going by your own account, this is another story. My own account of what? In the book about Narendra Modi, who really rather generously suggested questions to you before an interview with Sudarshanji of RSS. And he gave you some really aggressive questions like why is the uh, attendance in, in the Shaka so low? Why are you letting all the other forces that RSS dislikes? Why are you letting them flourish, such as the church, etc., etc.? He gave you great questions. Obviously, that was done in confidence. And you wrote about it, and you wrote the questions that he gave you. And you also wrote, I mean, I, I think I really need to go to the book on this. He said, question Sudarshan, Sudarshanji about the RSS loss of relevance. No longer does it stand you for You don't excellence. have to read out to me what I wrote, I remember No, it. it's for the viewers. Okay. There are other people here also. I'm glad you're aware of their existence up to now. You treated them as Oh, you poor fellow resorting to little sarcasm. Now let's get not back little, to it. Huge the sarcasm, RSS not runs 20,000 schools and 50 papers, but none of them have achieved. This is Modi giving you the questions, but none of these have achieved an, any measure of national distinction. Uh, further on, he says, just look at Kerala. The biggest RSS unit is there, but its impact is minimal. So he gives you a whole series of questions. And what do you do? Instead of using those questions, you write all the questions in an article titled, Go, Mr. Modi, Go. And then you end the article with, the man I thought I knew was a leader. He had the spirit and the wisdom to rise above narrow confines to turn opponents into friends, to win admiration from journalists, to guide and be followed. The man I discovered last week is a mere creature of prejudice, of petty vengeance, of double standards and forked tongued utterances. The first Mr. Modi deserved to be chief minister. The second deserves to be sacked. Now, how did you wonder why the BJP was boycotting you. But you're forgetting something which is critical. This article was written in 2002. And after that, Mr. Modi gave me an interview in 2007. And after that, there were several countless interviews with various BJP spokespersons, politicians, including various ministers. And they continued giving me interviews till January 2017. But so this was 15 is, years earlier, 15. The issue is that he was a source for you. You revealed your source in an article. That is, people, women, journalists go to jail rather than reveal their sources. This was not a source that I was revealing in the sense in which he was giving me privileged Again, elastic morality. No, this, oh, well, if you may call it elastic morality, you're very welcome to do so. You're very welcome to do so. You can't help it. But the fact is, you that can't help he it. was a source. You can't help interrupting was, with little barbs that attempt to condition the audience Narendra rather Modi than let the audience for judge questions. for themselves. And you, you exposed him. Well, and you know that would put him in a vulnerable and uncomfortable position with the RSS. Modi, forgive me, was not put into any vulnerable position with the RSS. After that 
column came out, he went on to become chief minister of Gujarat. He wasn't even chief minister in those days. He was an ordinary RSS Pracharak working for the BJP when he gave me that conversation. So it didn't affect him in the least. Please don't try and suggest and it that, did. So that uh, you don't have any qualms again no. of revealing your sources no. and the questions that he gave. No. And you claim that but he had... But you have just answered your question three times. No, 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 no. Again, elastic. So we'll have to call you Elastic Karan. Now, when Coin I... Coin whatever name you like, Pink that's Lady. That's my opinion. Coin so, whatever name you like, Pink Lady. When I went to... <laughs> Pink Lady, that's nice. Um, so when I went to meet Narendra Modi in Gandhi Nagar in preparation for an interview, um, he mentioned to me, without my bringing it up, he said, he explained why he left your interview. He said, Karan Thapar ne ye interview jo ki hai. He said that he had told you that he would give you the interview with the agreement that you would not ask him about 2002 and Godra. And two, three minutes into the interview, you did. No, not two, three minutes into the interview. I began the interview with that. All right, so. And therefore, and secondly, he never said any such thing. Before the interview was granted, we had no conversation with each other except for the conversation that happened the morning I arrived at the airport when he welcomed me at, on the phone and said, come early, we'll have tea. So he that, told me this, well, that's he may his have, word I'm against not, yours. I accept your word he told you, but I have only your word he told you this, I don't have his. And secondly, we had no conversation before the interview at all. The interview was fixed, if I recall correctly. I think I mentioned in the book, through the good offices of Arun Jaitley. Now, you were acting so as... So, wag on. Hmm. Let's come back to this so-called conversation he had with you. Hmm. I'm accepting he had it with you, but he yes. hasn't said so. How do I know for a fact he did? You can check with him. Well, I can't check with him. You can't just pick up the phone and ring well, up the I'm Prime Minister. Well, I'm saying it publicly. I'm sure you're saying it publicly. There are lots of things you say and publicly. And I couldn't say I'm it I'm not in a position... Unless I, can't unless I was sure of my facts wrong. when it's related well, to can, Narendra there are Modi, which can be checked. You can say a lot him. of things without being sure of your facts. First of all, you were wrong on one thing. You said two, three minutes into the interview. I oh, now Godra. we're going to pick it. I, I didn't say, I'm not I didn't say two, three minutes. And I said began. And secondly, you claimed that he had a conversation with me. You're really picking at straws. You said he had a conversation with me, and I'm telling you quite clearly he didn't. He had no conversation with me. I was so wrong in saying... Uh, two, three minutes into the interview when you started the interview. I was so Madhu, wrong. Madhu, you're, you're pulling. probably, forgive me, you're probably, forgive me, embroidering a conversation with Modi to try and turn it artfully to a question that would somehow make Karan look as if once again Karan went back on a commitment he had made. Okay. No conversation. There, was, Let me say there this. is no way me any journalist Let me can go on camera and claim to have said there are that Narendra Modi said something which is on record. You know full well that Mr. Modi is hardly likely to be watching news laundry. You know full well it's impossible for anyone to pick up the phone and ring up Mr. Modi and ask him, did you have a word with Madhu? This is a conversation that supposedly happened but when he was still in that Chief That can Minister. be applied to your and book. I mean, you've made all kinds of claims ago. with a friendship and with Benazir. We don't even remember. Bhutto, nobody so knows what's true. We can't, she's dead. We don't know what's true. So you can say whatever you like, that means. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm you apply out. the same standards. Yeah, I'm pointing At least out the therefore. person I'm quoting is alive. So? Thankfully. So? So if he was to refute it, he could. Okay. Carry on. I just now, wanted to point out that no such conversation with Mr. Modi happened. Absolutely none. And forgive me, I'm pretty sure that he wouldn't have claimed it either. I'm pretty sure he said it to me. I wouldn't cook it up. Well. I'm pretty, not pretty, I'm absolutely certain that he said it to me because he brought it up himself. I didn't go there and ask him what happened because that was not my subject of interest. Now, you acted as a go between, uh, between Adwani and the Pakistani High Commissioner. Uh, why did you do that? I mean, you're a journalist. How did you end up being what could be called a fixer? I answered that question yesterday, and if you were there at the launch, which you were, I don't see why you're repeating it, because it's already I live on Quint. It. It's on Quint. Everyone can hear the answer there, but happily I will repeat it for you. I didn't see that there was any breach of journalistic ethics in introducing and playing the role of chauffeur to take the Pakistani High Commissioner to the then Home Minister's home over a period of 12, 13, 14, 15 months. I can't remember the exact time span. Maybe it was about 18 months. And I may have done it about 25, 30, 35 times. Um, I saw nothing wrong with it at all. I was bringing together two people uh, who would, by forming a better understanding, benefit the country. And I thought it was my patriotic duty to do. Are you patriotic after calling England the civilized country you escaped to? Well, there's nothing unpatriotic about calling England civilized. 
Why is it unpatriotic? Because you said that you escaped to a I don't civilized say, country. I don't say escape. And that word you're putting in. I never said escape. I said I'm a great believer that you should start the year in a civilized country. And some things are said tongue in cheek. You probably missed the tongue in cheek quality because obviously that little delicate. No, no, but you got what you, you like wanted. To, you, you prefer got to bludgeon. To you prefer to bludgeon, don't you? You prefer to bludgeon. I was being delicate touch. I was calling England a civilized country. You got what you wanted. You got the attention on what, Twitter because everyone's say. trashing you for calling in. That's what The implication say. is, of course, you're going to a civilized country from an uncivilized one. But let's move on to your Sri Lanka story. But pretty uncivilized at the moment when we start killing people because they're Dalits or because they eat beef. We slaughter them because they are taking cows down the field or we claim people who are innocent to be child molesters or child lynchers or whatever. We're pretty uncivilized in that. You don't see that happening in most other countries in the world, be they rich, poor, Western or Eastern. I'm By not those going to come up with figures of what's happening country. in other countries. We're a pretty so let's just country. stop this because... Uh, I agree that I'm, nobody can be happy with what is happening, but it doesn't mean that you can just say that the only country that is civilized I is England. I never said the only country that's civilized. You, are, you have a great penchant for adding words. Only was one that you added just because now. Because you add, you add an implication and a nuance and then deny it. Let's go on to your Sri Lanka story, which I thought was beautifully written and well reported. And I'm going to ask you, why don't you do more of that? actually reported a story for a change where a bomb exploded in the hotel you were staying. What's the question? The question, why don't you do more well, of I that? I do, but I, I've done a lot of reporting. Your report. senior moment, I just asked the question, then you asked me, what's the question? I've done a lot of such things in my time. I've done a lot of reporting for newspapers. I've done a lot of reporting not for the... Not since you came to India. This Obviously is not, because Talbi. I was working in television in a particularly different field. In television, there's also street reporting. Yes, because I wasn't doing that. I, was, I deliberately chose to do current affairs journalism. Okay. Now, in your interview with Amitabh Bachchan, uh, you mistakenly, I guess, misunderstood him in a break when he spoke about Warren Beatty talking about I'm his love affairs. I misunderstood him. I was in my own mind in doubt whether he was actually inviting me to do what the interviewer had done to Warren Beatty. And I decided at the end that this was very tempting. And since the suggestion to do it had come from him, I would take him up. He didn't suggest that you do it. He just spoke about Warren Beatty. Of course. And it's a uh, strange thing to suggest to someone who's interviewing you in the middle of a uh, tape change break that, in fact, what you admired about a particular interview was that the guy had questioned you about the women in your life. And so I said, fine, obviously there's a sense in which he is suggesting it. Obviously he's not suggesting it in the sense of saying, I suggest you do this. But the clear assumption is that you don't alert an interviewer to a particular line of questioning unless you're half hoping or half intending that that same line be used to you. Yeah, that's and a so huge that. presumption well, that he's fine. discussing an interesting I'll, interview I'll, I'll, I'll and then you take it as a clue. Of course, anyway, of course it's a presumption. Didn't you feel a little uh, embarrassed asking him and then uh, have you had affairs with Praveen Babi, with Rekha and then his wife is sitting next to him and then he, after he denies it you ask her do you believe him? These are children. Not, what, it, of course you feel a little embarrassed. How do you not? Any human being would feel a little embarrassed. But there are lots of times when you ask questions which are difficult questions and not necessarily to Amitabh Bachchan but to politicians. And you'd rather you didn't have to but you've got a job to do and you've identified that this is part of the job at that moment and therefore you do it. And you overcome whatever hesitation you have. And similarly, whatever sense of small embarrassment I felt. And obviously it has to be small, it can't be huge embarrassment because if it was huge embarrassment, I wouldn't have asked the questions at all. But whatever sense of small embarrassment I felt, I overcame. Because I said to myself, this is something that is interesting to do. It's half been suggested by him and I will do it. So you were having lunch with Amitabh Bachchan afterwards and he was in an obviously bad mood. And you said that he shouted at Jaya. And you also wrote that he behaved disgracefully. But the I'll, shouting was the disgraceful thing. But then uh, many people viewing that kind of situation where you ask that kind of question would say, you behave disgracefully. But of course, that's my opinion. And of course, many people would say that. Now, after that, uh, Shobhra Bhartiya, your boss, and Amar Singh, who had arranged the interview, asked you to cut out that bit. Mm -hmm. You cut it out. Mm -hmm. And then you... <laughs> and then you <laughs> Leaked it to Anand <laughs> You're really funny. Then you leaked it to Pioneer. That's right. So, where are your ethics, Karan? That somebody the, tells you to cut it out and then you leak it quietly and then you write about the, it because you think yeah, that's if, okay? If I, if, if I recall correctly, I think the book actually says what I did next was not necessarily forgivable. 
but hopefully understandable. Yes, think, so you do all these I think I think that's actually there in the book, that phrase. Not necessarily forgivable, but hopefully understandable. understandable. But I mean Of course I did that. Yes, I don't so deny it. I'm 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 admitting it so up. You front. wrote it yourself. I know you don't deny yeah. it, which means that you really think that uh, ethics are for other people. I don't think that at all, but certainly in this instance that's my opinion. No, I think in this instance what I did was probably unethical. Now w in India, we actually have really crossed the line that you have in your interview with Amitabh. We journalists have stayed away from uh, personal lives in politicians. And once uh, Atul Bihari Vajpayee was asked about his relationships, and he made it clear at that time that ask me anything about politics, I will not speak about my personal relationships. And we've all known about uh, politicians' private lives you know but not, it's never ever asked mm -hmm. so do you think there is a line about personal lives i think there is a line that we in india have adopted about personal lives but i think the west treats personal lives and the personal aspects of a uh, politician particularly a publicly elected one very differently and therefore conventions mores morality ethics do differ they're circ they're circumscribed by the environment in which you live and the attitude of that society. The West takes a very different approach to revealing people's personal life. So would you say that in India it's okay? It's alright to ask someone like Amitabh Bachchan about his private life and his love affairs? I think on balance it is particularly because in this instance in a way he'd instigated it. I wouldn't normally go around doing that but in this particular instance he virtually instigated and I think it was okay to do. So would you open yourself out to questions like that if I asked you? Was Rajdeep not asking me such questions yesterday? And have I stopped you in any way from asking me questions? No, you haven't stopped me. But you dodged it, kind of. Like what? When he asked you, do you prefer girls or boys? And you said, girls more. I didn't say girls more. Mm. I said, I don't deny that I like boys. I like you, Rajdeep. But I'm not falling in love with you and I have no intention of doing anything further. I'm a married man, or was a married man. I still consider myself a married man. I wear my wedding ring, although my wife died 28 years ago. Um, he was being playful. He was uh, perhaps building on the fact that at one point I said that at the Cambridge Union I benefited from the fact that many people thought I was gay, which I wasn't, and it attracted attention. And I was quite happy to attract attention because it brought you words. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not, I have no phobia about it. Um, you can ask what you want. About your personal life, you've had girlfriends since Nisha died? A few, yes. So you're heterosexual, homosexual or bisexual? Heterosexual. Thank you so much, Karan. What a relief. Now I can flirt with you legally. You can flirt with me even illegally. It would <laughs> probably be more fun. Thank you very much. Pleasure.